Thank you. So my name is Armin, and I'm representing ICTV Iranian Calgary here today. Uh, we've prepared some questions for you. The first question is, the 10,000 IRGC members that the government put on the terrorist list, on what basis were they classified under this list? And who are the names on this list? Can they release this information for the Persian community in Canada? So, I'll, um, you know, I, I, I will be clear, and I've been rather critical of, uh, of the government on, on this step specifically. One, because I don't think it's enough. I, I don't think that they're using every tool in the toolbox, particularly the, you know, the, using the, the criminal code uh, to be able to bring the fullest extent of their powers on shutting down money laundering, organizing, uh, meeting in Canada. So on the, you know, on the 10,000, we we haven't seen we haven't seen the, uh, the 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 list. We're assured that you know the, the worst culprits, but we know that there's you know that there are family members of the regime that are studying in our universities, that are living in our cities, that are living in our communities, that are our, our neighbors, who without recourse continue to do that. And what we're seeing now is even worse: is that the intimidation has become commonplace, where it always has been there. The regime is a known. Uh, uh, is, 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 is known to have done this over the last four decades, but we're seeing it in the open again, uh, against voices who have stood with protesters who are fighting for the revolution in Iran. So, well, regardless of the 10,000, regardless if it's 15,000, regardless if it's 20,000, it's not complete until every member associated with the regime is on the list and the full extent of the law is brought on them, so they stop organizing, raising money, and, uh, and, and intimidating our own citizens here. And we won't stop until that happens. Thank you. The paintballs that the IRGC uses to fire at Iranian civilians were found to be a Canadian company's bullets and guns called Tipman. We need to know how Tipman was able to sell these weapons to the IRGC when Iran is under sanctions. So this is, I actually, well, I actually spoke to somebody here and it, it is the first time that I had uh, 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 heard of this, this specific case. For a long time, the Canadian government believed that we could do, we can make little moves with Iran. We can, we can, we can trade a little bit. We can negotiate a little bit and, and they will normalize as that trade relationship grows with us and, and, and other Western powers and us and others in the international community. And that's not true. It will never be true. They are an inhuman regime who is incapable of acting in a in the international community that is respected. And as a result, we have to have the fullest extent of our sanctions looked at by, by, by our officials, by those who make the rules and punish those in Canada who break, who break that agreement with the sanctions. We used to have a controlled engagement policy in this country where we would only talk to Iran on, uh, well, human rights would be one of, the, one of the issues. We would only talk to them on consular cases. In 2016, this government tried to open up relations with Iran. That was the wrong move. We're seeing it as the wrong move. And as a result, I think there are companies and those who fell through the cracks and were able to move around the sanctions. If the government doesn't start taking this seriously, the last 70 days hasn't taught them anything, then we have a much bigger problem with what we're going to do to keep Canadians safe in Canada on our soil. And that's all of you. And you've got to keep pressing the government coming together in rooms like this, coming together everywhere in, the, in, in Canada. I, I, you know, I feel like I go to a rally every weekend because I go to a rally every weekend and that's important and we can't stop. And the rallies need to get bigger and not smaller and you have to continue to press the government to do the thing that we know is right, to do the thing that they're going to do any, anyway. We just can't let them wait till it's, till it's too late. <coughs> Thank you. As we know, Canada has been a hub for money laundering for the IRGC. 
What practical steps have been taken so far in terms of laundered money by the IRGC to Canada? The Persian community needs to be posted about these updates. I think, look, uh, again, I, I think that becomes a question from the government that has uh, a history with a problem with, with transparency. I think there are a lot of announcements made. There is a lot of words spoken and potential comfort given to a community without much follow-up. We hear them every day when we ask them the same question. Canada, they, they repeat the refrain of Canada will never be a safe haven for terrorists from Iran or some version of that, but we know that's not true. We know that they live amongst us in our communities, they go to school, they work in our workplaces, uh, and they, they, they function in Canada with impunity. They've got Canadian passports, they've got Canadian citizenship. Some of them are, are, are becoming permanent residents and they're here to terrorize those in the community who have been here for a long time that are speaking against the very thing that they represent, which is the very thing that Canadians could never stand for. They are not like us. And so we need to continue to demand the government of, of clear updates of who they are, where they are, what they are doing to rid our country of the, of the threat that they pose on Canadian citizens and make sure that not only are they saying that they're taking the threat seriously or they're looking into it, that something actually happens so that I don't ever come to a room like this and more than three quarters of it raises their hand and says that I've been intimidated by someone I think is associated with the regime. That can't happen in Calgary, and it can't happen in Toronto, and it can't happen in Vancouver, and it should never happen in this country. So keep going, it's working. Sure. Can I have a follow up on that? Sure. sure. So let's say in six months, <laughs> your, your uh, party is back to power, and the conservative party is the party in power now. So. I, I'm guessing that you're going to have a big role in that uh, government that comes to power. So what are you going to do about it? Well, look, you, uh, you never assume what role you're going to have. You play the role that they ask you to, uh, uh, to play. But, but I do believe that uh, Pierre Polyab is the next Prime Minister of Canada, and I do believe that he, uh, that he was with you from the start, and he's going to be with you at the end. And I do not want to uh, uh, presuppose any of the foreign policy, but he has been clear on this one. He has been clear that this is a threat. It needs to be isolated in the international community. Canadians need to be kept safe, and we need to call terrorists terrorists. That's what I can promise you. Thank you. Um, we have found that Bombardier built engines have been used in Iranian tactical drones that have been sent to the Ukraine-Russia war. Once again, why is this Canadian company selling this to Iran? And how are they selling these weapons to a sanctioned country? Will Canada take accountability for that? Yeah, look, I, I think this is very much the same as the, the company that was found um, selling the, the, the paintballs. Anything. Anything that is in contravention of our sanctions deserves the, our fullest attention and the fullest extent of our laws to punish those who broke those sanctions. So whether it is, you know, whether it is the government of Canada that allowed this to happen or the company that moved around the sanctions because at a there was a time here where the government that we currently have in place loosened everything, tried to restart normal relations with a not normal regime, with a regime that Nobody in the international community thinks, acts in any way that is diplomatic, in accordance with diplomatic norms. So there was a message sent to companies in the years prior that maybe things would open up with Iran and that maybe if we traded, maybe if we made agreements, maybe if we negotiated, maybe if we put some treaties on the table that this, this would change the regime somehow. I think now the government knows that's the case, but they need to go further and make sure that everybody in this country knows which side we stand on, and to use, the again, the fullest extent of the law, including the criminal code, to punish those who are here and those who are in contravention of our, of our sanctions. That's serious. We have sanctions for a reason. And we have sanctions, in this case, to isolate a regime that is killing its own people. 
We're, we have to do the same thing, again, at the international community to isolate this regime that is killing their own people. We have to show that, we have to show the rest of the world that we are leaders in this to isolate a regime so that they have no more friends. And we certainly do not have to be their friend or even make any suggestion that anything will normalize until there is a free rep. <clears throat> That was all the questions for me. We do have time for three questions from the audience. Um, uh, I understand there is a lot of policies going on, but I, I give you just a simple case to be follow up. We have a high profile person and a network behind it with uh, billions, uh, potential billions of dollars have been laundered here to Canada. And they're based on, I know mostly in Vancouver, Mr. Haveri. And, uh, you know, they have been not, not even they have been touched, uh, but uh, their, you know, for example, real estate, uh, you know, network has been praised and been recognized by the uh, provincial and uh, federal bodies as, uh, you know, oh, you, you've done a great job. So that, that brings in, okay, I understand with money you can buy many things. Okay, you, you can buy the uh, lawyers, you can buy the protection, everything. But this is a good case. Just a simple case, as a test case, you bring up in the, in the parliament and see what happens in two weeks. So it is, uh, you know, so far ha what has been done is just a political, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, gesture. It is not really anything actionable. So this is a simple case, as a test case, that to show the trust that something can be done tangible, not just tax. I think, uh, just to give you, some so back and forth, and I'll, I'll take that away with, with, with Tom. There are a number of ways that we have within our system to, to get some answers on that. It's not, it's not always the 30 second Instagrams that I'm sure everybody's watching of people yelling at each other in the House of Commons. There is a, I think there is a way, there are other ways to do that, and I think we'll follow up with you specifically. I know that you probably, we're the easiest people to find on the internet, so just reach out uh, and, uh, and we'll follow up and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I'm in Canada. Yeah. Just as a general question for maybe you, IRCC, or any of our leaders in Canada, I know that when I applied for immigration to Canada, I filled out several forms from background check, everything. Yeah. How that background check works for people that are coming from Iran that are affiliated to the government? And I do understand that that also kind of ties with the other question about bringing assets to Canada, because I also know that when I, as a normal citizen, want to do any transaction in the bank, but anything that is more than even $5,000, $10,000, it gets blocked by the bank until they, re they just investigate the resource and everything. These are many loopholes in our system, and I do understand that these or maybe just using fake identities, but doesn't that sound naive of the government that is not even able to identify those if they are using wrong like fake identities? How do we, how do, how does that background check even work? Because that sounds to be definitely unfair to me as a normal citizen. If I want to do anything, I'm always bound by all these kind of rules. But then I just yet see that all these people are just doing from, from the law very you know, freely and they even kind of mock the problems and like tease us from, you know, within our own community that yeah, you are so naive, you can't do anything. I really want to question the whole government and I do appreciate that you as one of the leaders that is listening to us today, what actions have been made and what are the things that you can do? So just bear with me because my voice is almost dead. So when you came to Canada, just like me when I came to Canada, you would have gone through the background check, so-called. The king, so you used to do only paper applications. There was nothing digitized. So whatever you put into there was a paper application being sent around the government. So that information would wind up on somebody's desk, usually at the RCMP, and they would go over your document and double check that there's nothing like a red flag to them. But right now, it's random based on the visa officer how deep that check goes. So I know for a fact 
that there are Kurds from Rojavad, for example, who have their visas refused from coming to Canada because they have participated in uh, activities against the democratic government or against democratic principles as we know them in Canada for the last six years. But this is the Iranian government. They're not democratic, they're a tyrannical autocracy. That makes absolutely no sense. There are 110 applicants that I know of, and I've seen the refusal letters where they literally use a section, section 34 of the IRPA, the whole just subsections will list reasons to deny you your visa. And it's based on that background check that they do. So there's a whole bunch of reasons to do so. Frankly, whatever you put into that application, the Kenyan government treats it like the honor system. They're just assuming that you're telling the truth, that that's literally what happens. After the fact, what they're looking for is if you lied at any moment, they can strip you of your status. They can strip you of your citizenship as well if you lied in order to obtain it at any step in the process. So that is really the only thing, that's the, only, that's the ultimate punishment that can be levied against you. There were some years in the past 50 to 20 years where up to a few thousand people a year were stripped of their citizenship because they had lied in the application process. In the case of Iran, like to be truthful, the Canadian government, and us too, we have no way of knowing who is a member of the IRGC and who isn't because the IRGC doesn't go around publicizing the list of names of their members. Like some of them obviously are online on Facebook and you know, it's written in Farsi. I sadly can't read Farsi, so I have no idea what's going on. I also can't read Kurdish, so I have no idea what's going on. So unless they're very public about it, unless their kids, their daughters and their sons, nieces and nephews are putting up videos on Instagram, partying it up while talking about their dads or their moms who are senior members of the regime, we have no way of knowing. You know, you know much better than I do. Um, so it's up to you to inform on them if they're coming to Canada and abusing our system. Because they're, they know when they put in their applications, they tell just enough to obtain the visa. It might be their second or third try getting it. But they provide just enough information while omitting all of their family connections to try and get it. And really, it's a lack of information on our side. And our government, so the previous conservative government back in 2012, cut off all relationships with the Iranian government. There is no government to government connection at all. So there's no information sharing. We don't know who are pensioners from Iran. We don't know who are members of IRGC. We don't know who the companies are. And Iran is the most sanctioned government entity of all of them. You take every single other governments and companies that we sanction, uh, Iran it stands more than all of the other countries combined. Iran is stands alone as the most sanctioned one. So when you have companies, when you have people coming in, um, they're usually they're not openly lying, but what they're doing is they're providing just enough information to get the visa officer to say okay. And a lot of times, lots of very innocent people have their applications refused for the, what I consider the stupidest reasons. For example, I'm sure some of you have experienced this, which is before you came to Canada, you had to prove that you did your conscription service. Well, right now, IRCC is still requiring people to prove that they did their service in Iran, which seems to me blatantly insane to require someone uh, to prove that they did their conscripted service in Iran when they're trying to flee Iran or trying to come to Canada because they're trying to avoid their service. Like, that would seem like a very logical reason to flee Iran and to leave the country, uh, but we're still requiring people to do that. We're still requiring people from Iran to produce a police check. So if you're a Rojavati Kurd, or you're a Persian democracy activist from Tehran, or you're an LGBT Iranian, uh, you're going to be told by your a Canadian visa officer to go down to the local police office, even though there's videos of you protesting, to get your police check from the same people who are very likely to arrest you and beat you up and probably kill you in your prison cell. We still require that of people. You need to ask for a waiver to get it. So I've already mentioned all of this to the Minister of Immigration in a private meeting we had just a few weeks ago, that this doesn't make any sense. But that's where we're at right now. Just as an example, 
but in Oregon, I work at the University of Calgary, and there are thousands of students that are coming, all, you know, every day, every year from Iran, and I, as someone that actually does their admission process, I do know that some of them that are affiliated with the government. I don't have any proof. What is a channel that I can call upon that and then other people can also bring, maybe, I don't know, maybe someone from my community knows. So where are some of these kind of channels that we can call upon that and other people that may know or have some, you know, solid proof against them, then they can provide it. Because they may not be aware of anyone that is, you know, uh, making any action. It doesn't have to be that necessarily, um, you know, the identity doesn't need to be necessarily identified. So it can be anonymous in that forum or whatever, like, um, you know, channel, whatever that you call it. But still other people can just, um, um, just pre provide something to prove, prove, to prove that. Do you know anything? Or if there isn't anything, how can we initiate it? The method of doing it. Um, it, and before you go accusing someone of being a regime member, be absolutely sure that they are before you destroy someone's life. I mean, as an open warning, um, that's usually what like the national associations do. Like the Ukrainian Canadian Congress usually tells the government that they they know who the community member are who are pro Kremlin, and they basically inform the minister directly. So just simple as sending an email and having those personal connections. Um, if it's criminal though, so. If, say, the you know, prison warden of Evin prison happens to be in Canada or his wife is in Canada, I would encourage that's, you know, it's, that is borderline criminal. Uh, that's where the RCMP would step in. Um, so when it's criminals of RCMP or the local police service, you go to them and you say this person has committed criminal acts, this is what they are, and they're supposed to take it up, take your statement, and then follow through on it. If it's accusations of being, like, connected to the regime, so, for example, like maybe like um, you know one of the mullahs from Khan, maybe his family has come to Canada, maybe like Toronto, for example, and they're hiding their or corruption. In those types of cases, I would email the minister's office directly. Like there's a public email account there, and provide as much detail as possible while removing as much of like the emotional content, the names, middle names, where they're from, who they are. Um, and then any links, online links, like you'd be amazed how much actual intelligence is just clicking on a bunch of links and going to these websites. People post way too much about themselves, even on places like Facebook and Instagram. Most of that is enough usually to have a person then have their uh, visas revoked based on what is on there. I, and I will say this though, this is still a free country, and in Canada you're allowed to have a stupid, insane opinion if you want to. And there are going to be pro-regime pro -regime people even in your community as well. Just like there are Polish, I'm Polish, I was born in Poland. Just as there were pro-communist Poles, uh, they're entitled to their dumb opinion. Uh, and we can have a debate back and forth with it. Uh, but they didn't commit anything. You don't commit a criminal act by having a dumb opinion. That I, I will say that too. You, do, you are borderline a member of the regime though, if you are here in Canada because your parents have sent you here so you can avoid the dangers of the regime. That's exactly what the King government is trying to avoid. So we're trying to avoid by trying to list these organizations as criminal and we're trying to sh shutter the world. If we're going to help the protesters and the revolution in Iran, we got to shrink their world as much as possible. There can be no place for them to flee. Once there is no place for them to flee, they own all their decisions. If the mullahs know that their family members are trapped in Iran and that the regime falls, they're trapped, their family will have to make amends and will be held accountable for the last 40 years since 1979. Um, they'll make different decisions, I would hope. Uh, and if the world shrinks, hopefully they'll make better decisions knowing that they're stuck with those decisions. They don't get to leave the country that they have basically destroyed since 1979. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we only have time for one more question, but before we do that, there's a statement that this gentleman would like to make. But it's very important. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't stand up. The strikes started in Iran, in almost uh, more than 50 cities. The truck drivers, the oil companies, they are going to major strikes. Probably the teacher school system. 
they need support. Their family needs to, they need to feed their families. There have to be a fund allocated, but we are not asking Canadian government to give us money or to help us. Iranians can support that. It is extremely important. They keep the strikes going on in Iran and their family be fed and supported by us Iranian author and there should be a channel of this flow of money through the reliable sources that we have which is not connected to Iranian regime. Just to keep that in your mind, I don't need just an answer, just a consideration. Brought up, I often get the, the message of how do we how do we support financially the, the movement and so we're we, we, we've asked some questions about how how we can make that possible to your point without having the regimes uh, the regime intercept that um, and it, to get to actual people it is always difficult in uh, in the first stance uh, right now the, the only thing that we have in Canada that supports some of this movement is sort of that is the association <coughs> that exist here that are doing the advocacy that are speaking to government the association for the victims of PS uh, 752 for example so that's what we have right now and I think we're, we're we're asking the right questions about how to ensure that flow gets to the people that need it most thank you we know everyone has a lot of questions for them but we have one final question here because they do have to go at one o'clock as you are aware there are tens of thousands of young people who are in prison and whose lives are in serious danger any second some already on death row by the Iranian regime courts, with no right to have a lawyer. How can Canada help them? Is there any possibility to put more pressure on the Iranian regime for their release? I want Tom to have a chance now that his voice is cold. Yeah, I know, it's cold. Um, so I mean, those people who are in the prisons, uh, I, was, I told her this is not gonna be a happy answer for you, but. There's very little that the Canadian government can do, or parliamentarians can do. Like I said, we don't even have an embassy in Iran. We were the first Western government to shut down their embassy and not basically delegitimize the regime. But I mean, Evin prison ranks up there with like uh, Masanjia, which was the worst prison in the Beijing's network of uh, oppressive prison system in mainland China. It ranks up there with the Mokotau prison, which was the prison in communist Poland where dissenters, democracy activists, priests were sent. Usually you never left Mokotau and Evin has the same uh, reputation, uh, but everybody should know about Evin. Uh, not enough people uh, in the world know how bad the Iranian regime truly is. Like they see the soccer team right now playing and they think oh, it's just another country from the Middle East. Well, it's not. And the more people go out there and explain that this is an aberration of like a glorious Persian history that's been there for thousands of years and the most have taken over a country and led it down this very dark path and where you have thousands of people who can be put on death row for the simplest of acts of just going outside and taking, taking off a headscarf and demanding freedom um, that, that's ridiculous but there's very little the Canadian government can do um, and I think at this point even if we were to go and say do things like you know advocate for individual prisoners I don't think that the uh, government in Tehran cares one bit what the Canadian government has to say. That is the sad truth. They really don't care what I have to say. Uh, I'm working my way through countries I'm banned from traveling to. I'm pretty sure I'll add Iran. We'll add Iran to it too eventually. Um, we've both been banned from Russia, so, you know, these countries, I think I've been banned from Pakistan as well. Um, so we're just adding countries we can't go to. But uh, the prison system that Tehran runs is one of the worst in the world. Um, it's up there with, like I said, Makatao, Masanjia, and you, the worst ones run by the Soviet Union as well. So that's the unfortunate truth. I, I don't want to sure go into it. I, I know it was supposed to be the last question, but I just want okay, to... It was the last, last question. Just, just last, last question. <laughs> there are red lines for the government to be wrong. Regardless of who thinks what. Regardless of who is working for who. What matters to the government is the money. Money is their blood. FATF is their red line. They accepted every sanction, but not sign the FATF. Why? Because that's the only way that they can get money, right? We are living in a we, we are living in a world that money talks and money money is everything. So the best way, that's my suggestion, instead of think instead of going after who is working for who or who is thinking what, we better see 
what I do with my money. Where do I get my money and how am I going to spend it? If I'm here 17 years paying tax, working hard, getting money from a corp, um, oil and gas company and paying 40% tax and not <coughs> spending any money outside this country, I can't be guilty of anything, right? But there are people that they're not doing anything. They're bringing money or they're making money and they're sending the money to the government. That's the easiest part. That's the easiest part. CRA can help you big time. Why? Because CRA knows exactly what we do, right? You don't know where I travel, when I'm traveling, who I meet, who I talk to, but you know exactly where I spend money. That's what I want the government to focus. That's, and I'm only one person, perhaps, but there are lots of people here that can, you know, back me up. I can't send money in Iran without any trace. It's not that easy. Thank you. Um, thank you to our wonderful MPs for answering all these questions. I'd like to invite Arman for the closing remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is our friends. Thank you so much. Many of the Iranian people know you very well because you did a very great job. On top of everything which we mentioned about the sanction, they need hope, which you guys are doing very well in the parliament. You are our voice. Thank you so much. Keep going. We are victorious 100%. There is no way to come back. We are in the revolution. Please call this revolution. Please start from you guys. People is watching. People is hoping. So please, on top of every statement which we do, so I'm asking everybody of you, what you do at least, every morning call your mothers, your sisters, your brothers. They need a hug, they need a wish, they need a hope from us. Many people we are hearing they are having arrest because there are many propaganda, there are many news which they are using. You see the FIFA World Cup how they are doing together. So we need to be there, not only in the political side, we need to be, have also solidarity from to closest people, to our family. And again, thank you so much for all the parliament members which did so far great, great job. And I hope, I hope actors and actors which only talking come and be in the good side of the world in the good side of the history and do the action. They mentioned 10,000. Who is this 10,000? Give us five names, at least, from the those which you mentioned already, which all other countries had. Okay, anyway, I'm hoping we are victorious, no doubt. Keep going, no scare for anything. And thanks again from all my friends. You are Iranian, though.